to join us any second. This is the Nutra Medical Report. Okay, uh, several breaking or, or lead stories today that I want to cover. Uh, I think the overall uh, story is essentially the struggle at very high uh, levels, and it's it's actually kind of moved from behind the screen uh, into the public uh, uh, arena, uh, the struggle between those people in uh, various countries, uh, from Israel to the United States, United Kingdom, France, uh, etc., who are determined to begin a general Middle Eastern war, a uh, World War III, virtually, and those people in those same countries who are in high positions of power, who are equally determined to prevent uh, the outbreak of the Third World War. Um, and it's a back and forth struggle. Um, Tim, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Yeah. You scramble <laughs> to the scramble from uh, bio breaks to uh, back to the studio. Studio. <laughs> so tell uh, tell us the latest and uh, give well, me up to you speed. Well, it's it's what we got is the, is is the struggle between people that want to start the war in the Middle East and those that don't. Uh, and it's it's uh, it, it, it's quite interesting. You have uh, the Turkish, and, and sometimes the same uh, people are talking out both sides of their mouth. The Turkish prime minister has has said it would be uh, uh, absolutely horrific. It would be virtually Armageddon if uh, Israel uh, attacks Iran. Yet on the same time, the Turks are doing everything they can uh, to begin a war with Iran through the back door of their neighbors. Syria. And uh, a major breaking uh, story on that is the uh, northern Israeli military forces have gone on war alert uh, as of today because Turkish officers have taken command of two key uh, so-called Syrian rebel brigades. Uh, and it's, it's felt that uh, Syria may take uh, some steps because of that. Uh, the so what you're saying is that the Turks now have directly allied themselves with two brigades of Syrian Free Army, which are basically NATO, American, and British and French supported. So now we now we have the fault lines forming, where Turkey literally is at war with Syria. Yeah, the Rebel North uh, Liberators Brigade uh, in uh, northern Syria and the Talwid Brigade, uh, which is northeast of. Uh, El-, El Pego are taking operational or- uh, orders from Turkish officers, and the Turks are moving to take over additional military brigades. And, uh, you know, the Turks are, are a NATO military force. Uh, they have a very good military. The uh, foreign uh, mercenaries um, are really a joke. They've proven themselves quite brutal in slaughtering unarmed women and children, but uh, when it comes to to fighting a professional military force like the Syrian army. Uh, the Syrian army keeps uh, chewing them up and spitting them out. But the Saudis and the Omani uh, and other of the uh, uh, Gulf Cooperative State Conservative Monarchs are paying a great deal of money to very uh, poor, out-of-work uh, Arabs from North Africa and the Middle East uh, to enlist in uh, this jihad. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're paying 50000 or more dollars uh, for people to sign up. And so yeah, I heard the latest numbers between seventy five to 100000 to sign up to go in and kill Syrians, Syrian army, and, and to, quote, uh, now t- they, they made a statement they're going to start shooting at civilian airline jets flying into Aleppo or Damascus. Well, you know, that's a war crime under any, anal- uh, I mean, under United States law. Uh, and anybody that does that uh, is subject to 
war crime uh, charges in the future. Uh, so, you know, uh, and the Russians have, have made, by the way, that particular point uh, that it is absolutely, completely unacceptable uh, to begin firing on the civilian airliners. But uh, you know, th- th- this is our tax dollars at work, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it's it's unbelievable uh, the kind of stuff that's going on now. Um, France has uh, vowed, or actually has made the decision now, to provide heavy artillery to uh, Syrian rebels uh, to quote unquote smash the Assad regime. Um, We have also got a situation where the French foreign minister has said that Israel should not attack Iran. And uh, so that's kind of, you know, Israel and France and and, uh, uh, Turkey are both talking out both sides of their mouth when it comes to this situation. Uh, Partly, uh, there's talk of a deal between Obama and the Israelis to postpone a war until after the election. Other people say, no, that's not true. Um, what, we're, what we're witnessing now is a very unique uh, set of events in world history. You can try to draw analogies to the period leading up to the First World War and the Second World War outbreak, but uh, they really don't. The analogy really doesn't quite fit. You have a situation where a little over a month ago, the Israeli High Command, the top generals in the country, virtually mutinied against their defense minister Barak and their prime minister Netanyahu. They refused to go to war against Syria based on the erroneous uh, information that uh, Assad's regime had begun moving their weapons of mass destruction to their air bases, their chemical warheads. Um, and uh, American generals have put similar pressure on the Obama administration. Uh, less than two weeks ago, you had the situation where the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff flew into Jerusalem, uh, literally told Netanyahu to his face, uh, hell no, we're not getting involved in the war against Iran and Syria, got back on his C-17, flew into the most defended air base uh, in human history, the Afghan, or the um, Awan air base in Afghanistan. We spent $2 billion in perimeter security for that air base. And according to the official story, uh, some raghead with a shoulder launch missile almost took his massive C-17 plane down, injured two people on the plane. What they really was was a uh, was a Israeli hit, uh, but it, they didn't succeed. The chairman is fine. Now today, literally today, it's come out that the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we uh, only in the last few years have we had a vice chairman. This is a four-star admiral, and he is in Israel on a secret mission. Uh, so you know it's 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 a back and forth thing. Do we attack Syria? Do we attack Iran? But the overall uh, the overall basis for this is not really being challenged. Why in the hell should the United States, when it's in the midst of a new Great Depression, when literally 50 million people, by the latest estimates, at some time in the last few months, haven't had the food, haven't had money to buy food, have had to go for shelter uh, to shelters for food have had to use food stamps why should we get involved in yet another war a war that is almost certain to become the third world war we don't need to you're a military expert so i'm going to just propose this i mentioned this in a couple of other shows i if i was a president what i would do is i'd call up Bashar Assad, and as i said before i'd apologize for supporting terrorists that are coming in and killing his military police and civilians the second thing is I'd say I'd only come into Syria to stabilize the weapons and to make sure there's a force there that's conjoined Russian, Chinese, NATO, etc. force to make sure that those weapons are stable and that nobody, especially these Muslim Salafi Muslim maniacs, will get access to these weapons because if they use them against Israel, Israel will use the Samson option. And on the other hand, Israel needs to be restrained. They cannot do an air attack without our tanker bomber refuelers. Why don't we just tell them, look, you need to polish your nuclear missiles underground. We're going to make sure you don't launch on these characters. And the Israelis actually have enough sense they won't unless 
they're surrounded by enemies that are going to shoot at them. So all we have to do is stabilize the situation. We don't need an, an, a no-fly zone. We don't need an air attack. And we sure don't need an invasion to start a regional war. things on Tuesday night uh, Jay Leno one of my favorite comedians uh, and also a very bright guy was interviewing Ron Paul and Ron said I'm not going to do a third party run that's very significant because roughly 10% of voters are conservative uh, libertarians uh, we know that only about 10% to 11% of the undecided voter are actually even involved, according to polls, in watching what's going on in the election the Republican convention I think actually went pretty well I think the Democratic Convention is not going well at all. And now with the introduction of Ryan and the statement by Romney that he's going to uh, uphold marriage and the sanctity of life, uh, the the uh, Mormon Church is going to hold him to that. And now that he has a conservative Catholic uh, with a two clues in terms of he's actually got brains, Ryan does, in terms of balancing the budget, you're going to see, I think, a, 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 a shift in the voters coming behind Romney and Ryan, and when that happens, what I've heard from my sources is that Obama is ready to pull off something very, very bad. Uh, that if, well, that, 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 it is true that, that people tend to not switch horses when we're in the midst of a, of a particularly bad war. Right, but I think and, uh, Obama is uh, very likely to give a green light because he's already sort of promised the tanker bombers. And to be honest with you, the Israelis just want to bomb the hell out of the Bashir reactor and the missile silos. But what I've heard is only about 20% of the missile silos that the Iranians built actually have missiles. Most of them are false. And we're covering a huge area of you know millions of square miles. I don't think they're going to get to Coma. I talked to David Rubin, who lives in, in uh, Tuesday, he was on the program, and he's been in the military in Israel. Uh, he lives in uh, Shiloh, or Shiloh, they call it, in the uh, northern West Bank, and he said their biggest problem that the Israeli military are concerned, and they talk about it on the news, is they don't think they can get the deep uh, facilities for centrifuges or for nuclear weapons that are a mile down below mountains like Qum. And, and that's uh, therefore, what they know about. And that's what they know See, about. The problem uh, is... 25 yeah. or so years ago, I, 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 uh, there were three of us had lunch at Long Beach. The president of uh, a very, very leading-edge high-tech aerospace firm in Long Beach, one of Israel's top generals, and myself. And this general, this was before the Gulf War, and we were talking about the threat to Israel from... Uh, 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 or not Assad, from Hussein's... Uh, uh, well, they were called Scud missiles, but they were really the Al Hussein missile when it was a modified Scud. And uh, cruise missiles. And he said, look, your Air Force and our Air Force, we can take them out. And I said, no, that won't happen. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, we know where they're at. We can find them. I said, do you really? I, and we were in uh, my buddy's favorite uh, uh, restaurant. He was out near the Long Beach airport. And I said, look, this uh, in the, the, air, the restaurant was a single uh, level, very big uh, restaurant. And I said, how many Scud missiles or all Hussein missiles could you park here? And uh, I said, you can make the walls so that they knock down or slide out. You could uh, pre-survey the launch points. You could roll the missiles out. And in two or three minutes, you could erect them and launch them. And I said, uh, give me a little money, and I could put some lead in the roof. And I said, uh, there's no way the latest satellite uh, uh, radar penetrating uh, satellite could, uh, could locate them. I said, you can't begin to locate uh, all Saddam Hussein's missiles, much less take them out. Well, right guess well, what? By the way, the launch three phase years of later, uh, I was yeah. proved right. Right. Yeah, anyway, because you've got a genius at, at, at sticking, picking out military strategy. And well, here's it, the point: it, it's, it's simple hide. I mean, this is the well, kind it of is, stuff it is for you, been doing Tim, for, for it, centuries. Well, it is for you, but see, here's where the people need to understand why we have this program on Thursdays and why you do our our, our news blogs on the on the live stream channel and pop in any day of the week. People need to understand if you don't understand the geostrategic military and financial side and how they're all integrated, like the European Central Bank opening up the floodgate of buying as much bonds as they want, three-year bonds, etc. What's going to happen is this. If Obama looks like he's losing, he's probably going to try to trigger some kind of level of conflict to be a war president before the election so there won't be an election. Because the current trajectory is Obama's sinking and Ryan and Romney are rising. 
That's what's going on. Yeah, and, but uh, and I, I agree with you on that. I, I, I frankly, uh, I guess I, I would say I like Romney more than Obama, but I agree with Gerald Clinton. And he packs on both their houses. I'm not voting for either one of the turkeys. Uh, but well, actually, know, yeah, actually, my son had an interesting comment. Uh, my second oldest son just got married. He said, you know, if you did a survey, and actually, I maybe have people look at the survey, um, and. Uh, <laughs> You may find you actually believe in more of the policies of the Green Party or some other party than either the Democrats or Republicans. But the key issue is, to me is who is going to form the government? It's most likely going to be one of the other of these big parties. The other ones really don't count because they're not in the White House. They're not there. Well, uh, of course. Uh, the the don't bells. Don't count. They don't count. But, so but here's, here's what happens. The if you, There's if you, really if you, one party, <laughs> and that's, that's the money party. And, and behind the services, uh, and the money party goes all the way back to, to the, the so-called glorious revolution in England when uh, William and Mary took over the throne and kicked the last of the Stuart monarchs out, which happened to be uh, Mary's brother. And William of Orange and his wife came over and, and became the, the kings of uh, England and, and Scotland. And that was essentially uh, the, the foreign-based Dutch, uh, it was exactly, uh, yeah. essentially Jewish uh, banker money, and the Rothschilds eventually climbed to the top of that ladder, but there are many others there. They're not all Jewish, by the way. Uh, and by the way, uh, when you say Jewish, that, that's not fair to the Jewish people. No, These people no, no. happen to be, happen to be uh, Talmudic Jews, but I know a lot of Jewish people, and their names are Rothschild or Goldman no, Sachs exactly. or whatever. Yeah. By, by, yeah. by and large, most of the Jewish people have been victims, all the way from the victims of the Absolutely. Pharisees victims lying to them about their own people at the time. Well, it goes right back to 2,000 years ago when they lied to them about the Messiah and even changed the date so they wouldn't accept Jesus. And then they looked for Bar- 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 uh, Jesus Bar- Kokhba, and he didn't turn out to be the Messiah, so they all lost even more faith. And then during the Holocaust, they're wondering, why would God let this happen? So what the Jews have been victimized more than any other people on earth, including by their own so-called predatory superclass. Uh, so we need to have, that's why I'm a, I call a Christian Zionist. I believe in the state of Israel. I believe when I stepped off in 1992, I was stepping on American soil, and I believe American soil is, in a sense, a sister nation to Israel. And as well, Israel goes, so does America. I'm not a Zionist, but I wish them peace and prosperity. No, if you that as soon as you say you wish them, it means you're a Zionist. By Zion, I mean that we would, if we do not support the city of Israel, it'll cease to exist. But also, its fate is tied directly to ours. If we cease to honor God like the Democrats, they had to rewrite it quickly to put God back in, and that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. They had to quickly put it back in there at the protest at their Democratic National Convention by Muslims protesting the idea of even having the mention of the word God even in the opening statements of the, of the uh, Congress. I mean, well, that was amazing. Ultimately, we are in a spiritual battle. Right. And it's a spiritual battle between those that want to destroy the but, planet but a spiritual and battle, life on it. But it's and, a spiritual and, battle that belies into a, a geopolitical and a word battle. It's a thought battle. It's a semantic battle. Well, uh, but spiritual battles always are. Yeah, but I, I don't think, let's put it this way, I don't think, although they're, quote, people say choose between two evils, I don't think that term is really is exactly correct. Uh, the first term of Ryan Romney will not be anywhere near the second term of Vladimir Obama. I remember when, I remember, I remember when I lost my mind. Welcome back, and uh, we have Chris Harris here. We're going to go back and forth dealing with uh, tying these issues together because while we're talking, we still have the seeping uh, tar volcano, which is the uh, British Petroleum Macondo, which is the devil's food, seeping at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico that's destroyed the loop current, destroying and disrupting the world climate. By the way, Dr. Bill, Isaac Uh has stirred up a lot of that oil. 
I'm sure it has. It's in fact, it's still showing up in, in Louisiana. Exactly. Now, the, the fact is that oil is still coming up. It's not stopped. They're still putting cracks in. And the other important news is that the lawsuit and the settlement, which is going to be around $11 billion, is now falling apart because British Petroleum and its proxies are trying to see if they could actually eliminate the $11 billion, saying it's very unfair. The actual <laughs> parties that be are trying to raise it to $21 billion. This is not going to get settled. And the fact is BP is now interlocked with a Russian, largest Russian oil company. This is part of an international scheme. I believe that they actually did this on purpose to disrupt oil and, and quote, end the carbon age. I think it's a scheme. It's interesting, British Petroleum is also the largest manufacturer of solar panels on the earth. Isn't that interesting, BP? So we have that. We also have Fukushima now. And Chris, give us the latest news on what's going on because we have the Toshigi Forest Eyed as Nuclear Waste Disposal Site. This is an interesting report on Yaita Toshishi Pre- Prefecture as a candidate site for final uh, disposal of waste and radioactive substances. Uh, they're, they're trucking this all over the darn place. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's 600 kilometers away from Fukushima. And there's also a report on the IAEA on the states can uh, conclude on discussions on nuclear safety. So uh, let's talk about some of these uh, latest news items you pulled up. And uh, I had a discussion with Maggie uh, regarding Arnie Gunderson. And, of course, he's been putting out a lot of video reports at Fairwinds. That's F-A-I-R-Winds.com, Fairwinds.com. And the latest, of course, is the balance between pumping nitrogen in to neutralize the hydrogen generation and the danger of a hydrogen-generated critical reaction. And the biggest question is they don't know how these nuclear explosions occurred. Well, I would propose to them, because of my background in nuclear physics, that there's a number of ways to detonate a nuclear, a micronuclear bomb. You can use plastic with Krytron switches, high-speed switches. You can use what's called supercapacitors, which we've developed to create a supercapacitor, very, very narrow pulsed, extremely high uh, uh, amperage pulse that will actually trigger off a nuclear explosion. And you can use micro lasers that are actually around the nuclear material. You can use modulating things such as we call red mercury, which the Russians developed, which is a polonium-210, which is, by the way, the poison they found in Palestinian Yasser Arafat, which is used, they call red mercury. The real issue is that when you have hydrogen explosions, they can produce criticality. And this has been demonstrated now numerous times. The problem is it also means a lot of other nuclear reactors on Earth may have another way of creating nuclear critical reactions, which we didn't anticipate. And what the latest reports from Fairwinds and Ernie Gunderson have raised is the idea that they're walking a tightrope with how much nitrogen they put in because if they put too much in, it purges or flushes radioisotopes out. And if they put too little, they're going to have a hydrogen explosion. So none of these sites, reactor 1, 2, and 3, cooling pool number 4, are all either being purged, and we know the 61st uh, major release of radiation occurred two weeks ago, or they're going to have hydrogen-generated explosions, and these are going to go on for centuries and millennia. So let's go over some of these reports, uh, Chris. This is very significant, what's going on in terms of this uh, Toshigi forest area. And they just and literally burning average nuclear waste all over Japan, put up in the troposphere, coming over North America and all over the Western world, being picked up now in southern Brazil, as well as the eastern slope, the eastern side of Australia. So you used to think, oh, well, that won't cross the, it won't cross the Vilcabamba, Ecuador, it won't cross to Australia or Brazil. Not. Uh, so what's happening? Well, you know, uh, for quite a while. We've all known that this was going to be a waste management nightmare. Right. Uh, their, their cleanup is going to be, you know, whenever you clean one thing, you make something else dirty by its very nature. I mean, that's how you, that's how you do it. You take something clean, you wipe up something else, now you got a dirty rag. So now they just need a place to, to stow at least uh, lower level uh, waste products from, from the Fukushima uh, site. So now. Japan is going to put it in the coast. At least they're going to put putting it in a forested area, a national forest uh, in Yaita to- uh, Tochigi Prefecture. So there, there was some nice pristine land that will now uh, have a high level of radioactive waste stored in it for a certain amount, you know, for well, forever, I would imagine. And I'm, I would hope that it's not the highest level of radioactive waste being stored there. I think it would, uh, would be the lesser. And the highest would still be at Fukushima because there's no way to move the sludge. And um, 
that, that they actually are creating by using the uh, water reclamation system that they threw together to, to make a, uh, so they can keep on injecting water and trying to recycle it. But the problem with that, of course, was what we discussed before, was that the, uh, uh, the uh, filtration system has residue and that's being stored. That stuff is screaming hot, you know. That's, yeah. that's a real technical term in the, in the nuclear business. Right. There's no way to nope. move that. Now, these tanks could, could, could rupture. They're running out of room. These tanks could rupture because they're not seismically built. They're, or because they just freeze up just like they did last winter. When they froze, they actually started leaking. Yep. So as we head into winter, and there was a major release of radiation that occurred at several points last winter. One was reported by um, uh, Andrew, what's his last name? Oh, um, sorry. Um, one of the other websites and talked to talk about release of radiation. He thought it was back in, in, in of course, in in in, uh, in April, but it actually was uh, a number of weeks earlier in March. And um, what had happened is, was, it was everybody's trying to put a blackout on this. In Japan, you have to be vetted to even be a journalist there. If you show up as a journalist, and I've seen reports by Yoichi Shimatsu that's over at the Rental Network and read his reports, and he now refers to as uh, 2BE, and maybe it's a little spin-off of my statement made last year, I call it uh, 2PF. Uh, this is now in the year 2 post-Fukushima. Uh, we are now in 2PF. Uh, he called BE for me beginning of the end. I think, well, I'd rather like to, to, to just call it what it is. I don't think it's the end. I think it's just like with Chernobyl. Uh, if you don't mind the fact that you may be uh, having mutant descendants, uh, it isn't the end of the world. It's just the end of the world as you know it. Uh, yeah, well, you know, there, there, there's still, a, a, like I said, there's still a major uh, management problem uh, for waste there. Also, what uh, is not usually accounted for is the chronic dose versus the acute dose. Now, you know, we had the, the acute yeah. the initial release back in March, and usually the, the all the media and all say, well, you know, nobody really died from that. But yeah, it's still, called a pet, you've heard about it before, called a pet cow, P-E-T-K-A-U, it's a uh, Canadian... Uh, nuclear safety uh, physicist that came up with a pet cow uh, report many years ago, and he's proven it that extremely low dosages over a prolonged period of time are far more toxic by tens of millions of times than a big pulse of radiation that'll either kill you or not. I mean, so the the pet cow effect is much more damaging. That's right. That's right. And in the stars and stripes today, uh, that it's just something I just read was that there were at the time of March last year there were. Uh, uh, 60,000 United States uh, uh, all civilians, military, everywhere else, all over Japan, they're creating a database. I do, I do need to send you this article of everybody who was on, on that, um, in, in the area at the time of Fukushima so that they could track any, uh, it may be CYA, but they are certainly making a database so that they're going to see if there's any long-lasting effects. 50 miles away, there was one, one uh, the Sendai uh, base near uh, Tokyo. The people there are estimated to have gotten about uh, 1.2 rem straight to the thyroid. That was that's all just from I-131. Right. It doesn't uh, include uh, the other isotopes either. Just we're talking about radioiodine 131. Absolutely. And I think the, the percentages now is over 50 percent of children in northern Japan have thyroid nodules. Yeah, and uh, that, that that's a major. Uh, uh, point of contention is that you know, you're not studying all the isotopes. All you're doing is uh, honing in on your, your right. The body doesn't work that way. It's total dosage. It includes other toxicants as well. But the buildup of, of the the chemo or the buildup of the damage to the chromosomes is going to be horrific in all these people. Oh yeah, it will be unbelievable. Back in a moment with more data, and we'll integrate this uh, with Tim Alexander in just a moment. Let's touch on this other report here, and we're going to get back to Tim. Uh, this extraordinary meeting here, which uh, concluded uh, discussions of nuclear safety, and it's the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Association. Uh, that's IAEA.org, and we're going to, it's from their news center. Uh, tell us about this report, and what do they say? Well, you know, a long time ago, I just uh, I expressed my, uh, I guess my disappointment that 
all of the uh, signatories of the NFP of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty did not have a, a pre-planned uh, plan of action for this particular kind of an event where all the nations could possibly pitch together and, and have a plan and do something to, uh, to help with, the, with an event like Fukushima. Well, I guess now uh, that's going to happen. So in other words, what you're saying, and like your comment at the bottom, and you said here, after a year and a half, the IAEA finally agreed to, in capital letters you wrote, do something in the future, but report is attached, but I can tell you that it is their intention to get ready to do something, in quotes, instead of figuring out what action should be taken now. Not a confidence builder in my book. In other words, they basically said, oh geez, Fukushima's bad. We should plan to do something in the future if something similar happens. And Fukushima, by the way, is only starting to get ahead of steam on. And there's a number of technical issues we've raised here. Now we talked about the latest with Ernie Gunderson of the injection of nitrogen that can flash radioisotopes, or if you do too little, cause hydrogen explosions that can precipitate a hydrogen explosion and or criticality causing a nuclear explosion on the site that can blast these particles all over the place in the troposphere, out in the oceans. We've got a, a basically a we want to call corium down in, in the groundwater and underneath the ocean floor that's generating millions of becquerels per hour that's being pumped out in steam tubes out in the ocean floor all over Honshu in the Northern Islands, venting out 61st major, quote, release they did on purpose because they can't contain this of highly radioactive steam and radioactive water, millions of tons of water into the Pacific Ocean, purposely released. No attempt at all to either contain it with air att attempt with a scale with a Kevlar spider silk tents and air filtration system and buckyball filters or anything else to turn into solid radioactive waste. No ground penetrating radar to find out where the helicorium is. No under no open discussions about what other types of things cause criticality because they knew and they know now that criticality occurred in reactor number one, even before the tsunami hit. That reactor actually went critical and exploded. We know that reactor number two has lost the corium. It's well below the plant. We know reactor three is a MOX reactor. had a nuclear explosion on the top. According to Arnie, a detonation, which is over 1,000 uh, miles per hour, which means they had a nuclear explosion possibly triggered by hydrogen because it's very touchy. And that means it injected uh, that radioactive plutonium and other particles 50 to 60 miles away, you know, pieces of bars and fragments the size of uh, your fist, 50, 60 kilometers away, but also uh, that debris everywhere. And we have no idea what they're doing. And you know what they do on the weekend, as we mentioned before? They go home. They don't have anybody watching the store. There's nobody actually with ground penetrating radar. We don't have any satellite imaging trying to even look through the ground with torsion field imaging. We've got nothing. And when I sent my report, by the way, which I sent off to the Academy of Environmental Medicine, I have no response from, Dr. from Senator Wyden's office from Oregon and no response from Diane Feinstein's office. Nil, nada, nothing. And that was an excellent Not impressed. You wrote and uh, it was definitely well written and it was uh, well sourced. And I'm, uh, I'm not surprised that you didn't get a, an instant response, though. So. Well, my next step is I'm actually going to have to file a lawsuit and start uh, forcing subpoenas and uh, doing on these people because our congressmen and senators need to get off their ass and realize if this thing blows, and now we're also talking, we talked about earlier, and I want to get back to Tim on this, these maniacs in Israel, and not all of them, there's only a tiny minority of maniacs, and Obama, who will apologize this into Armageddon being the false prophet that he is, He'll apologize into, oh, you can have those tanker bombers. Don't mind. You can hit the Bashir reactor. We don't care that the, uh, you know, the physicians for social responsibility have said if you hit Bashir, you'll kill 32 million people. But what's 32 million when you got 7 billion and there's too many people anyway breathing out <laughs> carbon dioxide? So, you know, we, we really have a major gap in understanding that we're responsible for people like Obama getting away with this crap. And we're responsible for the fact that if they hit the Bashir reactor, we're not only going to kill probably up to 700 Russian scientists and technicians and kill millions of people from Iran, which is ancient Elam, uh, Burma, across Pakistan and China because they're directly downwind, but we're also going to probably destroy the human race and genetics. In fact, if you don't mind the fact that your descendants will all be mutant, and the only way you can have a normal child is to submit your gametes to a laboratory to have polar body exclusion to make sure there's no genetic anomalies, having a normal child through normal sexual practices in a normal non-radioactive world, 
will be historical anomaly that will just be something. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could live in a world where we could just have normal sex in a world where you breathe the air and you can have a normal child that isn't mutant? But guess what? That's going to be a thing of the past. Well, you know, besides being a strategist and uh, an analyst, I'm a theologian yes. and a Christian. And, uh, Good thing. Good yeah, thing you actually yeah. have spiritual brains as well as technical and geopolitical yeah. brains, because and if you don't have the whole package, we are doomed. Regardless of, of, of the timeline, whether it happens uh, in five minutes or five years or whatever, exactly. uh, we, are, we are headed towards uh, an event that the Bible has, has predicted for almost 2,000 years. And you can see it. In fact, you have to be blind not to see it. Uh, you can see the rise of evil and its spread throughout the world. You can also see that a lot of good people are standing up against it. You also have people that ne aren't necessarily so good, but uh, are They have a survival so instinct. They have a yeah, survival they're, they're instinct. They're not so bad that they... they, 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 they not only that, they they're, they're not stupid. Them. We, we have billionaires that have private islands and Airstream jets and, 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 and private yachts and everything, and they think, this isn't good for business. This is no. not a good thing to do. They realize whether you're, you know... Uh, you know, Jay Leno with your 200 cars and your fancy uh, garage up in Hollywood Hills, and you got solar panels and wind generators. He's got high IQ. He can understand this. There's people out there that are just average Joes driving a taxi and say, I think that what Deagle's saying might damn well be true. We're not talking about, you know, every generation thinks it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. I heard it before. It's actually reading in the Bible. Remember, it says this in the book of Acts and also in Luke. It says, they shall say, generation by generation, it's all preceded before. And everybody warned us all this is going to happen. And nothing happened. And, in, in God well, we says, didn't have nuclear and, weapons before. We didn't have or scalar biological, biological weapons. weapons. We didn't have scalar weapons. Or the convergence of all these things. Uh, uh, just. The man's almost had a nervous breakdown because he hasn't yet kicked off WW3, literally. And right. I, I linked an article uh, that pretty much said that a couple of days ago. I mean, the man is is is, is so. And the nuts. problem is, the problem is, you see, Netanyahu is trying to call in markers on Romney, and Romney at least has enough brains for the people around him to say. Not today, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Dempsey almost got bumped off because he disagreed with the with the maniac and chief, the narcissist, just almost like uh, the ancient Roman senator uh, uh, emperor that actually uh, made his horse a member of the royal senate. And a god. Yeah, a god. He was made. A, he said his horse was a god, and also a member of the senate. He was, of course, a god too. Right, yeah, he's a god too. Uh, hey, he should be a god, yeah. <laughs> look. Uh, uh, the, you have people that literally are fighting right now to save this planet and all of us from World War III. Right. And you have other people that are determined to go there. Yeah. You have the global banking cartel families that have so fouled the world in their quest for their new world order, for their total domination and ownership of everything on this planet. That's that why when the uh, European Central Bank... World War. Right, when this I Central mean, Bank did this today, Hey, right, when the Central Bank did this today, uh, Tim, and this ties in with the geopolitical, by next Thursday, which is the 13th, and Miss Friday the 13th, by Thursday the 13th, <laughs> they're going to have QE3, which basically means they're going to destroy the value of your currency in your pocket. They're going to steal right in your back pocket. You thought you had $100, you got 20 bucks. Or two. Or two. The fact is, people don't know between the geopolitical and the financial disasters coming and the almost certainty closure of the Strait of Hormuz. If they start this war, the Strait's closing. If that happens, we're not talking about the big yeah. R word for recession. They've been fiddling the numbers. We're sending we're a third carrier battle group to the Gulf right now. The British, the Americans, the French, and the German navies are, are, are doing a really massive exercise. In theory, to keep the, the Strait of Hormuz open, if when and if well, the war starts. Well, look at the statements, but one solution, open. and that solution is God. Yeah, you made the statement last week. Look at the fact that our military tells, uh, and Obama counters it and says, "No, uh, don't attack our ships and our navy if we attack Israel." 
And Obama <laughs> says, no, we didn't say that. This comes from the press secretary for Obama. Oh, my gosh. We don't remove Obama. Out, Absolutely. Amazing show today.